Thanks everybody, welcome back from lunch. Uh, my name's Trent Curtin, I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Community Safety here at Fire and Rescue New South Wales. Uh, I just wanted to introduce Dan Giraja from Motorola. Uh, he's going to speak to us just for a few moments. Motorola are pretty well known to fire services across the country. Uh, they have had a long-term relationship with fire services and are in most states of Australia. And we thank them for their sponsorship today uh, and for helping us to support such a wonderful tour and such a learning uh, experience and opportunity for us. So thanks very much, Dan. Thank you. Afternoon all, uh, thank you. And um, I must say, look, I'm filling in for one of my colleagues, Mike Stein, who's um, unable to make it today. He's, uh, he's in isolation. So most of you probably will know Mike, and Mike Abdachi has worked across the sort of the fire and safety and um, New South Wales SES police account. So, um, yeah, do uh, an apology from them. But uh, myself, I guess I'm Dan Jayaraja. I'm the service delivery manager that looks after these sort of uh, New South Wales and ACT. So, again, probably... No, some of you worked with some of you. Um, so having said that, look, let me just uh, quickly say thank you for everyone to being here. And um, as I said, my name is Dan. And um, look, thank you for um, being here. Motorola, as you know, sponsors the uh, Motorola Foundation, I should rather say, sponsors this event. So um, let me just give you a bit of background and um, and a bit of an introductory speech. <clears throat> so as you know, Motorola Solutions... The work that we do here makes a big difference in the public safety industry, especially in the critical moments that um, shapes our lives and businesses across the world, and especially in security. Um, but as you know, Motorola's contributions actually just not stopped there. We, um, Motorola as a company, over the past uh, <coughs> sorry, 10 years um, has donated over 100 million US dollars, uh, especially, uh, or firstly, to the um, uh, first responders and their families and also um, heavily invest in STEM and equal opportunities for underrepresented groups in the engineering and science and educational fields. Um, we, um, in general, Motorola prides itself in the work that we do in the public safety industry. Um, the solution, we, you know, which ensures that our public first responders are you know, uh, kept safe and the communities that they work in are kept safe at all times. Given that the events of the last three years, I mean, that goes to sort of highlight to us um, how complex the environment has been, especially given that um, we've been through natural disasters, the global pandemic, and not to say even the um, ever-evolving cybersecurity threats that we're facing in the industry. Um, hence, the public safety agency is always required to be on alert and ready for these things. And of, of course, look, what's happening is that the industry is turning to technology more often than the other. Uh, to ensure that they, you know, um, they can actually reach their high levels of performance, both safety and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Generally, as a technology vendor in the public <coughs> safety uh, sector, um, Motorola takes this uh, role seriously and uh, prides in itself, and that's why, you know, Motorola is continuously uh, developing in, um, sorry, I should say, funding in research and development continuously. And, uh, and ever expanding its portfolio of um, technology, which is pre predominantly mission critical communications, security, software, cloud and cybersecurity, and video solutions. Um, of course, these are to address the real threat that we're facing in the industry day to day. Additionally, I guess through the Mo Motorola Foundation, we're also able to foster uh, innovation and uh, innovative approach. And we connect generally with our organisations or you know, connect our employees to organisations whom share a common purpose in making more sustainable uh, cities and you know, <coughs> we are committed to making a real change in that environment. By supporting these organisations through, um, you know, we can actually, Motorola strongly feels that we can actually make the best of the, you know, help people be the best in the moments that matter. So... Another important way we can grow this um, is through the uh, industry knowledge sharing sessions, such as today, right, where we can bring in mm -hmm. ideas from around the world and, um, you know, have a joint session in sharing this knowledge. And it's through that, of course, that we're here today um, in, in, in AFAC Knowledge Series today in Sydney. So thank you again. 
And finally, look, on behalf of Motorola, once again, thank you for this um, collegiate and collaborative approach of network of individuals and companies that have come to today. Thank you. And look, we, um, you know, Motorola's commitment is always there. And uh, once again, look, thank you and a great, have a great afternoon, guys. Thank you. Right. Policy, risk assessment and incident management in the UK. Right. My only comment about the utter chaos and shambles in UK politics is as follows. <laughs> I saw a cartoon and it's a picture of 10 Downing Street and above it it's got Airbnb, ideal for short lets. <laughs> When I first arrived in Melbourne, I saw demonstrations with We Hate Dan. Yeah, You ain't got no problems com <laughs> compared to the UK. Anyway, UK policy. There you go. That's it. That's the extended version. Now, if we look below the level of government, <coughs> cabinet... Things are happening. So the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, we call BAES, has created com committees, as was stated in, in the introduction to myself, Energy Storage Health and Safety Governance Group, the Fire Safety Working Group, with work, which works with the NFCC. I've just finished a report funded by BAES on the use of second-hand electric vehicle batteries in domestic battery energy storage systems which is one of the reasons I get so annoyed because of everything I learned there. Um, the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles produced a consultation on essentially parking in closed spaces and obviously charging. Sadly, it was written several years before and was really out of date. So I've commented extensively upon it and so has the NFCC and other stakeholders. And we're waiting to see what the final report looks like because we don't get to see the final version until it's published. That's the way the UK works. Uh, I have to say a shout out for Dame Maria Miller. She's produced a draft bill that will require developers to consult fire services at the design stage of grid scale batch energy storage systems. I remain concerned that the marine side of things are complacent. I'm not slagging off the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, it's done a consultation. But I do think there is a degree of complacency that they may not appreciate fully the risks and hazards associated with EVs, particularly on densely crowded vehicle decks. Two people dragging a heavy fire blanket over the ve intervening vehicles and pulling it over an EV that's in thermal runaway perhaps is not the approach. Um, even if you do stick a sprinkler underneath the uh, blanket. Um, the British Standards Institute has now got three working groups on various aspects of lithium-ion batteries, which is very encouraging. Um, I was placed on two of them whilst I was in the flight here, so <laughs> it's nice to find out. Um, now, this is pure National Fire Chiefs, OK? So this is not me, this is not my expertise, but in essence... The National Fire Chiefs rely on a kind of high, top-level approach. They don't want to complicate issues by dipping down into fire, toxic gas, explosion. Now, a key element of the operational procedure is, first of all, the dynamic risk assessment, which takes full advantage of what's called the NOG, the National Operational Guidance System, which, as I understand it, is an information database that is available on the fire tenders through the computers they're on. Um, now, the problem there is, although that NOG system is brilliant, it's this flow of information to it. So, for example, there's no way for a fire service to know if there's a lithium-ion battery energy storage system in a building. Now, my advice to first responders amongst you is, if you see a wind turbine, if you see a solar array, assume until you're told otherwise that there is a lithium-ion battery somewhere, okay? Stepping aside a bit. So they do this, this dynamic risk assessment. That informs the initial kind of response procedure, which, 
I think for lithium-ion batteries, will, unless there is a threat to life or health, will be defensive. And that's what I would always recommend. And then they do more in-depth risk assessments, etc. So like I said, this is not my expertise. But shout out to Australia again. We're pinching your AFAC guidance with permission, I hasten to add. So very well done. It's amazing that you have far less electric vehicles than we do, but you seem to be far, far further down the line of knowing, at least knowing what you don't know and therefore being able to work out what you need to know. Right, yet another soapbox of mine, right? Second-hand electric vehicle batteries. When a battery in an electric vehicle reaches what's called 80% state of health, I'll tell you about that in a second, it's deemed no longer good for an electric vehicle. For example, it doesn't have the acceleration anymore. That figure of 80% is actually based on nickel metal hydride batteries, not on lithium ion batteries, but it is firmly established in the industry. Okay? Now, as I said before, we originally believed that then the battery would go for recycling, basically recouping of all the metals, smashing up. But of course, there's this massive second life industry that started up. Now, state of health is simply what's the maximum charge your battery will store now compared to the maximum at beginning of life. Now, the reason for this is that, and in fact, I'll take a step back here. Lithium-ion batteries shouldn't exist. They are thermodynamically unstable. So when you very first charge a lithium-ion battery, you get all those reactions I've talked about. The solvent reacts with the lithiated graphite generating hydrogen and methane and HF and all sorts of things. Now, if that continued, because it also generates heat, you'd be in thermal runaway and it would blow up. The reason that it doesn't blow up is that a thin protective layer forms around the graphite particles at the same time that all these reactions are taking place and it stops them because it stops the solvent touching the graphite anymore. And that layer is called the solid electrolyte interface. And it's called that because we can't really say crap, right? We don't know for sure what it is. We know it's fragments of organic solvent. It's got lithium in it, right? Lithium ions. And that layer is dynamic throughout the lifetime of the, of the cell. It grows, it's, it, it thins, it grows. But overall, it grows thicker over the period of the lifetime of the cell. And that means it incorporates lithium ions, okay? And this is the reason that when they make lithium ion cells in the factories, they charge them and they leave them for weeks to make sure that that solid electrolyte interface forms properly. <coughs> okay? And all the problems I've told you about with thermal runaway are down to that layer being damaged or removed. Okay? Now, if the lithium ions are removed as lithium ions, that's okay. That's believed to be benign, largely. If, however, they're removed as lithium metal, if you get metal plating, that's bad news. Lithium metal's the bad boy. Now, the state of health doesn't tell you anything except how much charge is left, because it does not discriminate between bad removal of lithium as lithium metal and benign removal of lithium as lithium ions. Now, the drivers behind the Second Life industry are huge, and they are entirely laudable. If you look at a lithium-ion battery, there is a far higher concentration of lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese in that battery than there is in the ores in the ground, right? And the amount of environmental damage, the amount of water you have to use, the amount of electricity to get those ores and turn them into the metals is just huge. You can see the kind of envi environmental damage. And leaving aside the cost of the ores, right? In my view, unless and until we have an effective recycling industry, we cannot have a sustainable electrification using lithium-ion batteries. 
And make no doubt about it, your recycling industries, your scrap yards, your materials recovery facilities are essential, essential to the success of our decarbonisation drive. As is the proper funding of all the necessary safety research, not least of which is your training and your PPE. Now, I'm going to introduce the terms reuse, remanufacture and repurposing. More about them in a second. But you could see reducing global warming potential and it could actually make it cheaper to charge your electric vehicles until the government slaps a tax on it when we run out of petrol. Yeah. <clears throat> so, reuse, remanufacture and repurposing. Now, forget the top line. If a car for some reason, becomes a write-off, but the battery is completely safe. And I do not believe this, right? If an electric vehicle is involved in a road traffic collision, scrap the battery, because you cannot trust it. However, there is a major industry in taking electric vehicle batteries from crashed electric vehicles and upgrading classic cars to electric using these. Now, if you're lovely E-type Jag, newly electrified, bursts into flames, it's your own stupid fault. <laughs> now, let's imagine that you could actually get a battery from a, a, a damaged electric vehicle, a, a, a chassis, and it's completely all right. If you take that battery and you put it back into an, another electric vehicle, that's reuse. If you take that battery, you open it, and you take out any of the dodgy modules and replace them, then that's remanufacture. But you have to replace your modules with modules that are the exactly the same state of health, the same manufacture, etc., as the other modules in that pack, the existing ones. Because cell balancing is critical. One of the biggest, most important functions, leaving aside the safety side, of the battery management system is to balance the cell voltages, the, the levels of charge of the individual cells. If you get it wrong, and one cell is slightly higher charge, but you're averaging out the state of charge, you can overcharge it. If there's something wrong with one cell, the other cells either side could dump all the charge into it. Battery In battery management system, cell balancing is critical. So if you then take your repaired battery and put it back in an electric vehicle, that's remanufacture. If you take your, your battery, remove the old modules, send them off for recycling, and then reassemble it for a new purpose, like storing solar energy, that's remanufacture. And all of these are happening. There are nascent firms across the UK who are doing all of this. They're looking at recycling, they're looking at remanufacturing. I'm not so sure about the reuse, but re sorry, repurposing, they're certainly looking at. The market is huge. The Authorised Treatment Facilities magazine in the UK, um, excellent magazine, the editor brokered a meeting between myself and representatives of the trade organisations for the recycling facilities in, the Can in Canada, the UK and the United States. They said that second-hand electric vehicle batteries were flying off their member shelves. I quote, the representative from America also stated that she would die in a ditch such that her members could sell what they want, when they want, to whom they want. And I'm not sure I'm her most favourite person. I'm certainly not on a Christmas orange list. Now, what's the problem? Okay, it's the ageing of batteries. And what, what state they're in when they finish their first life. Right, first life is the electric vehicle. Now, cycling under normal conditions, of, uh, according to the manufacturer's guidelines, should be completely benign. Okay, but even under normal conditions, you can get, say, a slight defect, even a temporary defect in the separator, and that can cause maybe a dry spot. If you've got a dry spot that's resistive, you get resistive heating. Okay. Now, what for once, what the academic community all agree on is that at some point, instead of having a nice slow degradation, loss of capacity, you get a sudden acceleration and it just rapidly degrades. 
and that point's called the knee. And we accept that that happens around 50 to 60% state of health. And again, we generally accept that beyond the knee, that battery is now likely to be unstable and should be sent for recycling. We don't know what causes the knee for sure. Some people believe it's just an acceleration of the original aging process. Some people think it's a new aging process. And this is what I believe. Now, the knee, if it occurs at the end of second life, that's great. If it occurs during second life, that's a problem. And what you've got to think about is, what about people who hang on to their electric vehicles because they love them? And then start thinking about, what about these, the back street, the small garages, the independent operators that are going to fix electric vehicles? Will they know what to do? Will they know what to look for? But what is certain is that beyond 50 to 60% state of health, it's time to scrap that electric vehicle. Now, thermal stability of lithium-ion batteries is generally assessed on the basis of typically the onset temperature for the exothermic reactions, particularly the temperature at which these exothermic heat-producing reactions become self-sustaining. We can also judge it on the time taken for thermal runaway. Now, the hazards are likely to be exactly the same as for first-life batteries. Toxic gas, fire, explosion. The big problem, and the big problem that dogs the safety aspects of lithium-ion batteries again and again and again, is the lack of data. And also, to a certain extent, the fact that what is happening is happening in silos across the world. People are getting little bits of money, little bits of funding, like us, and they're doing it individually when we should be collaborating. And SARET is a shining example of, of really good practice and collaboration, excellent practice and collaboration. The problem also is the cost of lithium-ion batteries. They're very expensive. So most studies are done on 18650 cells, which are the most accessible. You can buy them online. But also, they're not too expensive. But you cannot extrapolate from cell to module, from module to pack, and from pack to electric vehicle. You cannot extrapolate. So if you see a particular heat release rate, with a, a single cell, you can't then just multiply it by 8,000 and say that's what's going to happen with an EV. And also, there still is very few, still are very few studies where instead of sending the battery or the vehicle into thermal runaway and fire, you basically st send it into thermal runaway without fire. For example, doing the experiment in an inert gas. There's only a handful of papers. So, Studies on the vapour cloud remain very few indeed, of which, of course, Newcastle's one is one of, the, one of the few. Now, it is true that if you stick within the limits set by the manufacturer, you should not have any problems. But you do get other structural changes. So, for example, you do get lithium constantly being taken out, and that can result in different concentrations across the surface. Now, this can also lead to fragmentation. Also, you're ramming the lithium ions in and out of the crystal structures. That doesn't mean they're doing that. It means they're doing that. They're flexing, and that means you can get spalling. And if you get powders formed, if you get a powder particle just that little bit closer to the other electrode, when you charge, all the current will go through there, and you can get dual heating. And so you will get spalling, Okay. Now, lithium metal uh, plating is the bad boy. This should never happen if you stick within the limits. Lithium metal plating occurs if you rapid charge. And yes, the academic community are under no illusions. We, we basically agree, even with EVs, never mind with small cells, if you continually rapid charge, you will cause lithium metal plating. If you charge at low temperatures you will get lithium metal plating, okay? Highly likely. Rapid charging of us, as I've said. Now, this is because if you set a charging current that requires a faster flow of lithium ions to the graphite particles than can actually happen, low temperatures, you've got a viscous solvent, so they're moving more slowly, 
very high charging rates, they just can't get there fast enough, then the current has to go somewhere. And so instead of pushing the lithium ions into the graphite particles, any lithium ions that are already there will turn into lithium metal. Okay? Now, a natural extension of this is that because you're constantly pulling out the lithium ions, even benignly, into the solid electrolyte interface, at some point, surely, you will drop below some minimum concentration of lithium ions to be able to get enough to the surface. And there are at least one or two papers that suggest that that's why the knee occurs. It's lithium metal plating. And that that will occur even if you've been a, you know, you've driven it like a, a nice old lady or the vicar and kept well, well within the, the limits for the whole of the first life. And I would say, therefore, lithium metal plating probably occurs far more often than we realise. But also, there was a recent, recent, uh, recent example of a Nissan Leaf, second-hand Nissan Leaf, was driven from Germany to the Ukraine for sale as a second-hand electric vehicle, and it passed through a rainstorm. It was on the back of a trailer, and it went into thermal runaway but did not ignite. And it was nothing to do with the battery, at least the cause wasn't. It was because the seals on the battery case had gone, just worn, and water had got in. So it's not just the battery you need to worry about with wear and tear, it's the other things that might then cause the battery to go into thermal runaway. And also, I know that you're importing second-hand electric vehicles. I'd love to know what a second-hand electric vehicle was. Because in principle, you can't have a second-hand electric vehicle unless you sell it before it's reached 80% state of health. In which case, I, well, anyway, I don't know. Now, risk, as you know, is sample size times probability of hazard times the severity of the hazard. I would argue both the sample size is going up, particularly for new EVs, but it will start going up for second, second life batteries. And also the probability of a hazard occurring is likely to be higher for second hand batteries. Okay. Now, state of health is no use whatsoever. It does not discriminate between lithium ions and lithium metal being the reason why you're dropping in capacity. We need to define something called state of health. And in my view, state of health requires, demands, all the information that the battery management system stores during that first life. The charging cycles, how many times it's been overcharged, how many times it's been charged at temperatures less than 5 degrees C, how many times at temperatures above 40 degrees C. How many error messages? What kind of error messages? The, the BMS stores a huge amount of information, far more than you might think. And we need testing. We need the two together to define state of safety. Now, all UK, European and international standards rely upon tag tests. These are variations, but they all involve things like vibration, heating, etc. So if you take your battery, your EV battery, let's say it's got 200 cells. If you take 20 of them and they pass those tests, you can sell the other 180, so long as those cells are, are new to market, okay? It is fine for new cells. I worked with Nissan for three years and I saw how absolutely brilliant their quality control standards are and now how excellent Envision's quality control standards are. Those cells are produced to a fantastic tolerance. But it's not so good for a second-hand electric vehicle battery. Even under normal conditions, that battery gets hammered. Thousands of cycles. Leave alone cycling at extremes of temperature, which you can't help if you live in Northumberland as opposed to Darwin. Actually, that's the two extremes, <laughs> low and high. They get hammered. And what about the fact that when you take that battery apart, you might accidentally damage it? This is that Nissan Leaf battery I told you about that we took out. The team took this apart and measured the state of health. And you can see the state of health varies from about 57%, so 53% capacity loss, down to 49.4%, 50.6% capacity loss. Where you chose, and each one of those is a module containing four cells. So there's 48 modules, so let's say we choose five. Where you choose five from will, de will basically define what the state of health is that you think you've got. 
Type tests are useless for second-hand electric vehicle batteries. All they will do is tell you that that particular batch is safe or not safe. Now, British Standards Institute have highlighted the fact that there are no sta standard tests to assess the safety of a second-hand electric vehicle battery. To make things worse, the International Energy Commission and the European Union, in their draft standards and regulations respectively, explicitly only require the knowledge of the information in the battery management system. They do not state anything about a test, but IEC 6338, you see there, explicitly states that there are no tests at the present time to assess the safety of a second-hand electric vehicle battery. In other words, the IEC and the EU have copped out. They've sidestepped a very tricky issue. And the problem is that the information in the battery management system is intellectual property. It's valuable intellectual property. I'll leave it up to you to figure out whether or not the electric vehicle and the battery manufacturers are prepared to let that information be used by a third party. They rely solely on that data which may not be available. Now let's look at the market in Second Life electric vehicle batteries. This is a Tesla battery. You can see it's been well protected from the elements. It's on sale for £6,000 despite the fact it's damaged. Now in the parlance of the UK carriage of dangerous goods regulations, that is liable to rapidly disassemble. To you and me, that means explode. Okay? But the person sell, the company selling this actually knows that because if you look at the bottom there, it says free collection in person. Well, would you in the first place pick, actually charge somebody to come and pick up the kit? You know, if you're going to come and buy your packet of cigarettes, you're going to have to pay to come through the door. He knows what he's doing. Remember, these packs are up to 800 volts. They cannot be switched off. They may go into thermal runaway. And, you know, I'm going to nail my colours to the mast again and say, this trade must be stopped now. Now. Now, lithium-ion batteries are classified as dangerous goods. And so they fall under UN 38, and specifically 38.3, which specifies the type tests, of which there are eight, really demanding tests to destruction. If you are going to transport your lithium-ion batteries, which are new to market, they have to pass these type tests, which if they're new to market, is fine. UN 38.3 does not apply to second-hand electric vehicle batteries because there was never envisaged that there would be a second life of lithium-ion batteries. Now, UN 38.3 gets transposed into Regulation 5 of the Carriage of Dangerous Goods Regulations in the, UK, in the UK. If you send your battery, or if you get your battery and get it sent to you from the scrapyard by a courier, that courier has to be ADR trained, 10-day course, and a passing exam. You have to inform the Department for Transport. You're going to transport it in advance, and you have to pay £50,000 for a metal container to put it in. Or... You can rock up in your van, throw the battery in the back and drive off. Literally. Kudos to Australia again. This might not be perfect, but it's a really good step forward. This EPA law. This is very good stuff. Kudos to, to you again. In conclusion, and before I fin off, finish off with a thought... The unregulated trade in lithium-ion cells online should be stopped now. That is killing people. People who are building their own batteries for their e-bikes. The unregulated trade in second-hand electric vehicle batteries should be stopped now. There should be an education campaign across all governments aimed at all stakeholders. First responders, the public. What about people... What about... The car, the car rental agencies. What about the, 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 the garages that work for the car rental agencies? Do they know what to look for? You know, what about insurers? They should be waking up. They should be waking up and fast. Yeah? Everybody. Micromobility devices should not be charged indoors under any circumstances. They should not be 
even left indoors, stored indoors. The UK Parliament has banned e-scooters, e-bikes from every building in Parliament. Have they said anything about anything else? Well, what do you expect? We need to think carefully about these larger batteries on disabled e-mobility devices and, and their carriage on aircraft. Now, having depressed the heck out of you, one last thought, okay? Something about the deep penetration of lithium-ion batteries, okay? Uh, a contact of mine told me a few days ago that they're having an increasing problem in the scrapyards with a particular device. Sex toys. Thank you all. Appearing tomorrow, uh, next day in Wellington. Thank you very much.